you know, when I, when I was a student, as my daughter would say, when the dinosaurs were roaming the earth many years ago, um, you know, there wasn't so much knowledge. You know, it was easier to get, get up to the, the frontier of what we know in economics 30, 40 years ago, because there were just much less things to read, a lot less papers to read. But as the body of scientific knowledge has increased, it takes longer and longer to get to the frontier, um, to push that frontier forward. episode of the JHN Discourse brought to you by the Economic Society at University College London. We are delighted to be hosting Professor Van Renin today, who is the Ronald Coase School Professor at the London School of Economics and Digital Fellow for the Initiative for Digital Economy at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology. Professor Van Renin's research interests include the cases and consequences of innovation, and much of his work focuses on the themes of labor market, research productivity, and public policy for dynamic growth. He was the 2009 winner of the Yudra Johnson Award, the European equivalent of the John Clark Medal, the 2011 Arrow Prize, the European Investment Bank Prize of 2014, and the HBR McKinsey Award of 2018. Moreover, he was awarded the OBE for Services to Public Policy and Economics by the Queen. Let's now proceed to the interview. Welcome, Professor Van Renin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, so we would like to start off by asking a couple of questions about your career. Sure. Um, so your work predominantly focuses on understanding the causes and consequences of innovation. What influenced you to pursue your research in the field of economics of innovation? Um, I, I think it was just because I've always been interested in technology and ideas and how they've influenced the way the economy has changed and the way that um, people experience them in terms of how, where they're working and their jobs and their wages. And um, when I first started uh, getting interested in economics, it became pretty clear to me if you wanted to understand why countries grew faster than others or why some countries are richer or poorer than others a lot of that had to do with technology and innovation and that seemed to me the kind of fundamental driving force really you know why why is it the case in the last you know since the industrial revolution people have lifted so many people have been lifted out of poverty first in western europe but you know later in america and in, in asia and really that's all that's a lot to do with you know innovation new products new processes new ideas so that seems to be the fundamental thing to to kind of understand if you want to understand why countries are rich and some countries are poor now on to your research so first maybe have a, some questions on your thoughts on the future of ideas and innovations so in your paper are ideas getting harder to find you discussed the concept of diminishing marginal returns to research and increasing cost to ideas to explain why the innovation bank for R&D had declined. Could you briefly explain this concept to our listeners in the context of one of the case studies you reviewed? Um, yeah, so in, in, in that paper, we're trying to understand in some level why growth may have slowed down in recent uh, decades and what we what we find is that whether you look at the level of the economy as a whole or particular firms or particular technologies um, like semiconductors or crops or medicine it seems to be the case that the amount of um, productivity um, you get from every uh, euro or dollar you spend on research or the scientists you employ um, doesn't appear to give you so much uh, output as it used to in earlier decades. So, for example, if you look at um, uh, more semiconductors, so we know in semiconductors, which is the root of digital technologies, um, we have this thing called Moore's Law, where you can, every two years or so, you can double the amount of uh, transistors you can fit on the, into a silicon, and that's been happening since Gordon Moore uh, predicted this in the late 1960s, the CEO of Intel. 
So that seems like a, an you know, example of fantastic technological progress. You know, if you something like 35 percent increase of productivity every year. But if you look at what's happened to create that, the industry has had to have more and more scientists and engineers working in research and development. So that's gone up since the uh, but since the since the 1970s by a factor of something like 17, 17 times, if you like, more um, engineers and scientists or effort gone in just to maintain that same level of productivity. So that's the sense in which I, you know. You, you know, you get less bang for your R and D buck or your scientific buck, and that you know, even in that area, well, if you think is one of the most dynamic areas, you've had to devote more and more resources to get that uh, increase of productivity. And um, you know, at the macroeconomic level, you can see that because the fraction of people working uh, as researchers and engineers, or the fraction of R of GDP spent on R and D, has gone up and up. But yet the the growth rate of productivity has not gone up. If anything, it's slowed down. And if you look at, you know, whether it's um, you know medical research and cancer, or whether it's yield of crop you get from corn or uh, from soya beans, the same you see the same kind of story. The ideas are becoming harder to find, and there's good reasons for that, of course. As you know, as students, you know, you know when, I, when I was a student. As my daughter would say, when the dinosaurs were roaming the earth many years ago, um, you know there wasn't so much knowledge. You know it was easier to get up, get up to the, the frontier of what we know in economics 30, 40 years ago because there were just much less things to read, a lot less papers to read. But as the body of scientific knowledge has increased, it takes longer and longer to get to the frontier um, to push that frontier forward. And so it either takes you longer <laughs> as a student, you, have to, you know, you're going to be clever, of course, you're all smarter, but you know, you still going to work a lot, lot more and more years. So it's not just the undergrad year, you've got a master's, a PhD, et cetera, et cetera. Or you've got to work in bigger and bigger teams. So you see, you know, if you look at um, papers, there's more and more authors on each paper. And that's because in order to make a push forward for new ideas, you need more and more people who know more and more about different specialist areas. But that becomes harder because you're coordinating you know, 10 people instead of just two people. So that also makes it harder to come up with new ideas. So you know, there's, there's pretty good reasons why you see diminishing returns in, in ideas as there is in most things um, in, in uh, economic life, unfortunately. Okay, so building on that, given the problem of declining research productivity, and your recent policy proposal called the Hamilton Project. What are the most evidence-backed ways for governments to ensure sustainable dynamic growth? Um, well, I think there's lots of ways. Um, you know, as you mentioned in this Hamilton Project um, report we did, we try to uh, look at the evidence. So I think I always think it's important to look at the evidence, and you know, we can cover lots of theories, but really. When you're trying to think about policies, you want to know what works or what doesn't work. That's where you should start. So we try to look at you know, the best economic evidence where people have really made a big effort to uh, try and look at the causal impact of policies. So, you know, not just asking people, you know, when you gave them some money for research, do you, do you spend the money? But actually trying to um, say, look at you know a, a treatment group of some firms who say got a tax break or a subsidy compared to a control group of firms who didn't, and see whether or not that uh, you know the subsidy for say innovation or research work. So we found that you know you could think about two groups of policies. So one group of policies is um, called demand side policies because it increases the demand for firms to innovation. So tax policies, for example, like the search on a tax credit which incentivizes firms to do more R&D or direct grants or subsidies like you might see in medicine or defense, those do seem to be effective. So in terms of getting quick results, um, you know, having good tax, good subsidy policies are effective in terms of getting more research and, and ultimately more innovation. But they have a problem, which is that if all you do is increase the demand for researchers, um, in order to, to get more innovations. What you can often do if there's a not a lot of researchers out there is just drive up the cost of doing R&D. So the wages of scientists like myself, we're very happy because our wages go up, but we don't necessarily do a, do a lot more effort. 
you know, because there's only so many scientists to go around. So I actually think the best form of long-term policy towards innovation is to work on the supply side to try and create the kind of inventors and the entrepreneurs and the scientists of the future. So that's why, you know, human capital is very important, why, you know, encouraging people to, for example, study science and technology, engineering, maths, to increase the supply of people that way, you know, through universities and through decent grants is, is good. You should also have an open immigration policy to try and get as many, you know, <laughs> you don't even have to pay, you know, you have to pay to create the scientists or engineers, you just import them somewhere else. Now, of course, you've got to be careful. You know, you've got to take too many away from developing countries who need them. But if people want to, you know, come and work in, say, in the UK and on a particular area, then you should be encouraging immigration, not discouraging it. And the third way is to think about what we sometimes call the kind of lost Einstein or lost Marie Curie effect. And that's my belief that we waste a lot of our talent in, 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 you know, in, in America or in Britain or almost any country in the world, because there's so many people who could be great inventors, Einsteins or Marie Curies, who don't end up being inventors, not because they haven't got the ability or the talent, but rather because they happen to be, you know, born, they might be born in a poor family where there's bad schools and bad neighborhoods. So they never even dream that they could be, you know, an inventor. Or maybe, you know, there's discrimination against women or against minorities, which puts barriers to them to be getting the education and getting the opportunity to become the inventors of the future. So I think that, you know, if we could do things to reduce some of those, those type of barriers, expose more people, especially from these disadvantaged groups, to the, to the opportunities and ideas of becoming an inventor of the future, then I think we can unlock a lot of talent. So you can increase the quality and quantity of inventors. No, this is a very long-term project and got to work in schools and all to, to kind of do this. But I think in the long run, this would be one of the, probably the most effective innovation policy I could think of. Your paper in the fall of the labor share and rise of superstar firms showed how the winner takes most economy where firms with a low labor share capture a rising fraction of industry sales contributed to the fall of the U.S. labor sh share. In the context of the pandemic, do you believe we are seeing strong enough shifts in consumer demand preferences, for example, towards digital entertainment, a relatively automated sector owned by a few conglomerates? and away from leisure activities such as tourism with relatively high competition and labor intensive sectors to cause a further fall of labor share? Okay, so, so let me unpack your, if you don't mind, I'll unpack the question a little bit. Um, so uh, just, just, you know, we, the, what, what the paper just is about, I mean, you, just to explain to people who might be listening in a bit more detail. So, you know, um, if you think about the size of the economy, national income like a pie, the pie can get divided into different groups. I think there's a, there's a part of the pie who goes to workers in terms of wages and salaries and employment. And there's a part of the pie which goes to capitalists, uh, which come capital income and labor income. And it used to be thought, this is one of the so-called um, Caldor facts after the famous British economist Nicholas Caldor, that the share of the pie, the share of uh, going to labor was kind of basically the same, it didn't really change much. But what's happened, is, as you mentioned, um, Yashvi, is that in the US and many other countries since at least the early 1980s, and particularly since 2000, that share has gone down a lot. So economists are trying to think, well, what's happened? Why is the Caldor fact no longer true? And one of the reasons we argue in the paper that you mentioned is that the economy has become increasingly dominated by these very large, super, what we call superstar firms, um, like Google, Apple, Microsoft, um, Amazon, um, uh, you know, and as well in like in retail by, you know, Walmart, Costco, Tesco's and so on. And if you think about a company like Facebook, for example, one of the things you notice is that it's a huge company. Um, but the sh if you look at its, its sales revenue, only a very small fraction actually goes towards its workers. Workers get well paid. But compared to its profits and its sales, they only get a very small share of the overall Facebook pie, if you like. And of course, um, as more and more of the economy shifts towards companies like Facebook or like Google, then that puts downward pressure on the overall share of labor. Not because the share of labor is going down in every firm necessarily, 
but because more and more of the economy is going towards these superstar firms. It's kind of, and if the economy is more willing to take all, they win more and more of, 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 of the economy. So that's, that's, that's the kind of background to that. Now, and your question was, well, you know, what's happened during the pandemic and you know, is that going to um, increase that process? And I think it has increased that process because one of the things that's happened during the pandemic, as we all know, <laughs> like we're doing now, is that more and more of our activities moved online. So, you know, you as students had to have more teaching online from professors, people who, instead of going physically to have meetings, could do meetings over Zoom, even if they're in different parts of the world. People started shopping more and more online, um, you know, rather than going out to the, the store and buying it. From now, those, that, those changes are already happening, but the pandemic kind of supercharged those changes. And you can see that if you look at the kind of the market value or the sales of these superstar firms. So they, you know, um, I think it was in January this year, uh, Apple's market value exceeded $3 trillion. And that's bigger than the size of the British economy. So uh, yeah, that's just one example. And you, know, you can see that because of this greater move to digitization, there's more and more of those kind of online. Now, some of that may change as the pandemic recedes. But I actually think that it's likely to persist. I think once people have got used to, you know, doing more of these things online and companies have realised they can save a lot of money by having more people working from home instead of going in the office, that many of these things are here to stay. So I do think that, you know, the pandemic has kind of meant that this phenomena of the growth of the superstar firms has become stronger and that by itself will put downward pressure on labour share. There's other forces though as well. So, you know, you know, with, um, you know, a lot of job, you know, the economy coming back and more people demanding higher wages, that may go in the other direction. But I think the general trends are going to continue and become stronger. Okay, thank you. Um, your work showed that tax breaks for research and development are effective innovation policies. However, you also found that labor regulation discourages innovation. Given this, how do you think governments should navigate this de delicate balance between inno innovation and intervention? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great question. I, I think um, I think there's two there's two things to bear in mind. I think if you're thinking about good good government policy, so one is that you know you want to have policies which are good for productivity growth, in the sense that you know to create a bigger pie if you like you know you want to keep the pie growing at a regular rate now that doesn't mean that you have to you know it give, productivity growth gives you and innovation gives you choices you, know, you don't need to if you if, if you can become more productive it doesn't mean that you need to spend it all on consumption and you know, spending it more on buying expensive things you could actually use it to take more leisure you know work fewer days in the week or, or weeks in the year or you could use that to um, improve, you know, spend more money improving the environment and cleaning up some of the environmental messes that we, we have to live with. So, you know, productivity growth gives you options. And, and as I, we talked about before, the best way to get productivity growth is to have stronger innovation. So, you know, the problem with innovation is that there's lots of market failures. The private sector generally won't produce enough innovation by itself because, you know, one company gets a good idea and another company steals that idea. So the first company doesn't want to invest, you know, as, as much in innovation as it should do. So the government has to intervene and taxation and subsidies and you know, human capital policy, all the ways to get that. So that's one thing, the, probably the most important thing is dealing with market failures that the government has. The second thing though, is that you have to make sure the benefits are, get shared. So if the, if the economic play just keeps on growing, but it's only like 1% of the population who gets all the share of, the, of those fruits of growth, then that's not only kind of an unethical and a moral thing, but it's going to cause you massive social and political problems. And that's one of the things we've seen in many countries over the last 10 or 20 years with the growth of populism, Brexit, and Trump, and so on. So you have to think of ways of sharing out the benefits of, of, of that increased productivity in a kind of equitable way. And, you know, regulation has to be part of that package. You have to think about how you make sure some groups don't suffer too much because of the changes. So, in, in, you know, in recent times, the growth of the gig economy has meant that, you know, we need to regulate that part of the economy more effectively because people in the gig economy are doing very, very badly. 
Um, but we have to realize there's a cost to doing that. Nothing unfortunately comes free. And you know, if you do too much regulation or you do regulation in a, in a kind of, uh, in, a, in, a, in a foolish way, you can end up damaging growth, which will also be a, a, a negative thing for ordinary workers because if growth goes down, the pay on average will also go down. So you have to think about smart regulation, regulations which give protection but also don't um, reduce innovation too much. So, for example, in France, where you know we studied the effects of regulation, there are there are huge amounts of um, uh, additional regulation which come in when a firm gets to be 50 employees. So that acts as a very big disincentive for firms to grow, and that's why it can chill innovation. So I think that you could think about relaxing some of those regulations in France, and in some ways bringing in some of the people who are, back, who are not regulated very well, like people who are working in the gig economy, uh, which would make it somehow more equitable uh, playing field for people in different parts of the economy, but different parts of the labor market. If you could time travel 50 years in the future, how do you think our discipline would have changed? How innovative do you think the world would be then? You mean how, 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 different, how different would economics be? Yes, uh, economics as a discipline. How would economics be different? You know, there was this, I, I think it was um, Mark, I think Marx, Karl Marx was once asked, um, what, what, tell me what socialism would look like. And he responded saying, well, I, I can't tell you what or communism, I can't tell you what communism will look like because it's the music of the future. And if I could write the music of the future, I'd have already written it. Now, you know, in historical retrospect, given what happened, it's, sort of, it's a bit of a mistake of Marx not to have you know, put more thought into what might have happened, you know, had the communist revolution actually happened as it did. Um, but there was a grain of truth in what he said. It's very hard to predict the future of ideas, because if you could predict them, you'd, you'd be doing them. I'd be doing it, I'd be writing the paper. But I, I think there will be, a, I guess, I'd say three things would be different. So I think that, and we're already seeing this now, um, economics will be even more empirical than it currently is. So there's been a big turn in economics over the last you know, 10 or 20 years, a very healthy one towards looking more at data and doing more empirical work rather than writing, you know, grand, when I, when I was doing my grand theories, when I was writing my, my, uh, my, my PhD, the, the, all the prizes, Nobel Prize were given to grand theorists who are doing amazing theories. Now the Nobel Prize are actually given to people who are actually much more empirical, trying to figure out what policies work, like we were talking about before, or, you know, what's actually happened to, um, labor markets and product markets. So I think there'll be even more empirical, be a bigger emphasis on data. And I think my second point is partly because of that, will be, as we're seeing now, a lot more close integration between economics and data science and computer science. So the, 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 the boundaries between what we do as economists and what people do uh, in, you know, in computer, computational statistics and data, data analysis will be much more closely aligned together. So all the work we're seeing in artificial intelligence and machine learning, economics will start looking more like that. In fact, there may even not be a distinct discipline of economics. It might be part of the more broader social and behavioral science uh, where we take data, data more seriously than, 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 than we currently do. And, and I think that the, the third thing would be, um, I think that uh, there'll, there'll be a, a way a kind of a, a kind of internationalization of economics in a much greater sense than it, it currently is done. At the moment, it's still very much dominated by the United States and to some extent by, by parts of Europe. I think that the, the center of gravity is shifting much more towards uh, Asia, um, China and India. I think many of the, the kind of economic problems that uh, those countries face, you know, with very big populations, um, still maybe partly in the, the kind of development phase, although may that could, could completely have changed in the 50 years time. But I think it'll be a, there'll be a much more eclectic set of issues which uh, are, are, are done rather than the ones which necessarily are the ones that we focus at the moment, which are more based on kind of US, US kind of, and I, I guess part of that is like, you know, in the US markets are, are generally much more flexible, whereas in most other countries, institutions, play a much bigger role. I think that will be 
part of the way that economics changes will take institutions and policies much more seriously as things to study and understand rather than just saying you know you know they're just frictions and problems that we have to do when we think about our markets so i think those are three ways i think it'll be more data oriented it'll be a closer interdisciplinary angle especially with um um with computer science i think the subjects will kind of shift geographically towards issues which are less important and for, for america are more important for countries like india and china um that's all the questions we have for you we have okay. this episode with you and thank you